Bobbish. So, hi, I'm David, also known as Kuchen. Um, I've been programming in, uh, well, Haskell for over 10 years now. And it was a bit of a different time back then. And uh, Haskell was inside the community still regarded as very much, hey, this is general purpose, but everybody else said things like, ooh, you can't do this, uh, it's academic and, you know, like, proper software requires C++ and Java. Like, you would never be able to program, like, machines with it. And so this talk, uh, among many, many reasons, is a bit out of spite and also because it's a really cool project. So I'm literally cutting wood with Haskell now. Um, it's not going to be a Haskell talk because, to be honest, this topic goes in kind of two directions. One is, I want to show that Haskell is just very general purpose and you can use it for something like this even. And the other one is, it's not really Haskell specific what I'm doing, so if you want to have a go at what I'm showing, and I think everybody in this room can have a go at it, uh, just pick any language you like. Um, I like Haskell, I think it's a good fit for general purpose programming, but many other languages are as well. Um, anyway, so... Um, wood instead of ivory. I have a couple of examples over there, so I brought like literally results of what I'm showing you in physical form. And um, yeah, I have a couple of exciting image formats for you. <laughs> um, right, so overview. Um, first of all, maybe most of you don't even know what a CNC machine is or um, have a vague idea. So CNC stands for computer numerical control. So that means uh, you take a classical machine that a carpenter might use or you know somebody who draws and you put a computer instead of a human in front of it and you give it instructions and it does it computer generated, uh, basically a computer does the work for you. Um, you know CNC mills for example which is basically a drill going through machining stuff, um, laser cutters or other examples. And I built myself a little version of that, and that's going to be the core of this talk. Um, but then, first, let's ask well, what is a line? I mean, everybody probably has an idea of what a line is. This is an example of a line. It's very, you know, very cool. This is one representation of a line. It's, you know, pixels on a screen, and if you look up here, it's an SVG format. Um, you might regard this upper code also as a representation of a line. And these are probably the two lines you are familiar with. So when you think about computers and lines, one or the other is going to be um, what you think about. But there are, of course, many others. So if you come from, say, applied math, you might think a line is, you know, the idea of drawing a line. Or it might even be the idea of a line without even drawing it. So it's just, you know, something that is straight. But now if you look at a computer screen, you've never seen a proper line, you've seen pixels and your brain goes like, ah, oh, this goes like, I see a pattern and that pattern is kind of what I think is a line. If you're a mathematician, you might say, ah, oh, these pixels are just a vector but represented in a certain way and these are what most computer scientists or even artists might consider what is a line. Well, my line, my lines are physical movements of a machine. So it's arguably either what this machine draws or it might actually be the action of, of moving something around. Um, and I mean, I'm not a fan of uh, big uh, movie talks, but I have like a 30 second video just showcasing what the machine looks like so you can imagine how, what it does basically. So um, I'll talk in detail about all the parts later just to get you a bit more familiar with it. But the idea is that there is a little pen down here. This is a map of I believe Vienna in progress and well you can see the pen is lifting up and down and it draws a lot of very small lines and it does so in an absurdly precise manner and it has been going on for a couple of hours now um, this is basically the brain of the whole thing you see a lot of cables um, the fan, yeah. I could talk about the fan placement a little bit later. This is not up to um, safety standards. Um, but it's in my home, I can do whatever I want. It works. Also, electricity is literally... 
This is my machine. Um, right. Do you have a cat? Oh. <laughs> Jesus, no. No, no, no. That would not work. This is the reason I don't have a cat. No. Um, right. So you've seen it in action a little bit. Um, I would have liked to bring it, but you know, it's, it, the video doesn't convey how big it is. It's quite big. Um, so yeah, you'll see the example pictures later. So, um, well, why? Why am I doing this? I already mentioned this is a bit out of um, out of spite, but um, also it's the fusion of three very very interesting things. One of which you are all familiar with, which is programming, and the other one is art, and then there's also mechanical engineering. So, programming I don't really have to explain. It's really cool to see your program come together and do what you want. Um, mechanical engineering is a bit of a nerdy topic, maybe some of you like soldering and building stuff. Um, it comes with its own set of problems basically, like mechanical engineering takes an abstract idea and gives you real world problems that I have a section in the end uh, talking about um, how difficult it is sometimes to paint a straight line <laughs> because there are some pitfalls. And of course the last one is art and this is something I figured out last year when I, with, together with Franz, we, we built a libraries for um, generative art and the output was always um, digital images and you're all familiar with digital images and they're not really that impressive. Um, you've seen them a lot, you know, the internet is full of them. But then there is a, a hard to explain difference if you see it in front of you painted with a real pen, preferably a kind of not such a good pen so it does like little botches and mistakes so that you see that it's kind of hand drawn but way too big and way too precise for a human, so it gives you this uncanny effect of, wait, how can this, this doesn't, how does this work, basically, right? Um, so there's a bit of surprise in it, and then, of course, art can also be, you know, visually pleasing, it can be interesting in some other way. Um, I have plenty of examples. So, for example, one, one thing I thought about was just visualizing one kilometer of straight line, um, just basically having one kilometer of straight line on something. It's not visually interesting, but then if you know that this is the picture, you're kind of thinking, hmm, I wonder how long a fountain pen, for example, is. Um, things like these. Um, now, a little building montage of how this came about. Um, this is my room. Um, you can see all the essentials you need for living there, which is a bed, a computer, a 3D printer, and uh, lots of tools on the ground. And yeah, I basically wanted to have everything around, including my computer, so I just you know, made a huge mess, basically, but um, it's worked quite well. And you will recognize some of the parts later. So for example, this cross here, I actually can use this pointer, right? This cross here is going to be the X and Y axis later. These are lots of uh, parts, um, I don't know, wipes for cleaning up resin and uh, oil gunk. There's uh, some, yeah, lots of, mechanical assembly going on here. The whole thing is basically meant to be a uh, CNC milling machine, so using a drill, uh, which I was eventually planning on putting in there, but the problem with drilling is it destroys stuff. A pen is much nicer in that way, and worst case a pen can do is can ruin your paper, right? It's not like it can fling around and punch a hole in your wall or face. Right, then, uh, you know, this is basically the gantry assembled. Um, it's a huge frame out of steel steel tubes. The reason for this is they're easy to source and uh, relatively good quality, and everything around here you can see is uh, 3D printed um, out of PLA because it's very sturdy and also cheap and common. Um, put it on a base plate. This is a standard milk container for scale. Um, I didn't have any bananas, I'm afraid. Um, you can see the parts coming together so we can kind of recognize what, what goes on. So these are the motors. Later there will be a belt, uh, kind of a gear belt. Oh, they're called belts, so just, you know, things you can move along. Um, and that will move the whole system around. This is a dry test of this very laptop. Um, just, you know, this is, the, the, again, the brain of the whole thing. Um, these are switches, basically like uh, tactile, the fingers of the machine, basically so it knows this is zero, I can't go further, right? If it pushes on that switch, it knows, oh, this is zero, basically. 
So in the end, you will calibrate it. It will move to the left, for example, until it reaches a switch, and then it will know where it is. If you turn on the machine, it has no idea where it is, basically. So this is a calibration step. And well, these motors, um, I'm just not really steering them here. It's just I just wanted to see whether they're turning um, in kind of a reasonable speed before I built it into the whole rack because it's a bit hard to debug if you know, everything's already moving in the wrong direction. Um, yeah, this is the z-axis coming together, so the goal is that there is a motor up here. It will move this whole thing up and down, which is grossly oversized for a pen, so it's meant for holding a drill. Um, many, many kilos and putting in like, I don't know, 100 grams, but this is the, the design of the MPC and C. And yeah, then this will be the finished product eventually with a lot of mods. Right? You can see the, the sensors I've mentioned in the beginning down here. So when you turn on the machine, this whole axis will move slowly, slowly <laughs> down here, eventually touch the switch here and the switch here, that will straighten it up and then the machine knows where zero is, and from then on you can tell it go to position 70-70, which would be 70 millimeters X and Y, and the Z-axis um, lifts the pen up and down. That's, um, yeah, that's pretty much all it can do. Um, not many more sensors in there. Everything, all the wiring is still dangling around a bit, right? But the wiring goes up here through these uh, drag chains. They're basically limiting the amount of bend you can have on a, on a cable, because if you repeatedly bend, well, anything really, it will break at some point. Um, this will not be news for any mechanical engineers, but for me this was something new. I never understood why anyone would use these. Um, that's the reason, so these have a minimum bend radius in this plastic part. Um, yeah, what else do you see? Well, that's a lot of pens here, and again, a ready-made picture uh, here. I think I have this one with me here. Um, so this is A1 size. So half a square meter, so that's quite a sizable piece of paper. Basically this. Um, and we can have a look at this after the talk, maybe. Um, right, so, so much for the building part. Um, yeah, these don't go full screen in the slides. That's why I put them. Um, Put them in a separate picture. So yeah, why art? It's not something we're typically in contact with the software engineers. Sometimes we have debates whether coding is art or not. Um, typically I'm of the opinion if you discuss whether something is art, it probably is. Um, but sometimes we're, <laughs> we're stretching it quite a bit. Um, why do visual art, I guess, would be a, a better, better question to ask here. And, uh, I think there are three key points why I like to do it and why most people will also like doing it. The first one is you can hold your code in your own hands. This is something that you have to experience for yourself and it's quite easy to experience if you, if, even if you just do generative art or just digital painting kind of, right? You have something to show to people. So if your algorithm is pretty, your mom won't care, for example, or mine at least doesn't. But I show her something that's visually interesting and she goes like, oh, that's pretty cool. And of course, in my, the back of my head, I'm like, oh, I wish I could tell you about all the interesting algorithms, but at least they appreciate my effort, right? And that is something that was a bit new to me. I mean, of course, if you go to conferences or with colleagues, you, you're used to that and people are being interested, but uh, just ha having this hang in a friend's place, I gave something like this as a gift, and people are asking, like, hey, how, how was that made? And they tell you, yeah, David had it made. Um, which is the second part, see others' reactions. Um, they typically say, ah, oh, he had this machine painted for him, like, Jesus, I, I made this, I made the machine, I made the picture, I wrote the algorithms, I did this. It's like, you know, saying, ah, oh, Picasso didn't paint his paintings, his brush did. And I'm like, that's not how it works, right? You come up with the idea, you put in all the effort, and there's a couple of hundreds of hours in the whole project by, at this point, a lot of trial and error and everything. Um, yeah, and the last nice side effect is you <laughs> it's easy to run out of wall space at home so of course I'm not painting A1 pictures all the time but I'm painting on, on just off the shelf standard A4 um, because it's cheap I use cheap pens and um, then you get all these test images and once the test image is nice then you of course skate it up and use very expensive paper and expensive pens and whatnot but of course the uh, 
but the examples, they, they are still around. Um, so you can put them anywhere. They are still dec decorative, right? They're just smaller, maybe not as impressive. You wouldn't frame them in, in an expensive way, but it's, it's pretty cool to have. So um, my home is kind of plastered with, you know, nice, nice non-failure examples that I then maybe made a little bit bigger. And yeah, this is one example of something I, I made. It's inspired by actually a company logo that I saw a couple of years ago by uh, Christian Barge. He worked for, what's his company? They do FPGA programming with functional programs. And they had kind of a lambda that was a bit inspired by circuitry. And at some point I thought, oh, I, uh, I like the idea. And well, this is what I made out of it. And I've since put this into various formats. So this uh, became the, the logo for the Muni hack. So we put it on stickers. I literally cut it, cut it in wood. So this is that with a laser cutter. Um, well, you can't see it from the back. I have a bigger version for it, but it doesn't tra travel well, so I don't have it with me. Um, you can put it on the demo pile. Um, and since it can, if you can engrave wood, uh, you can probably engrave things like aluminum, such as, you know, say a laptop lid. So I literally put this laptop in a laser cutter and I have that laser cut into my laptop lid. Um, it's a bit hard to see. Actually, it's impossible to see for you, but if you come, come to the front <laughs> later. Um, it works really well on the darker uh, MacBooks, for example. Um, so you can, I don't know, a couple of people have my thunder now on their laptops. <laughs> so, let's talk about how a CNC works. Basically, three parts. You have the hardware, you have the firmware, which is a low-level software of the machine, and then you feed it you know, input to basically lots of go-to statements. For the hardware, well, I showed this picture earlier already. Let me go to the overview again. Um, I think I discussed most of the parts already. A um, little bit of a focus, so this is the z-axis. Um, these bl blocks here are motors, so they are called stepper motors. They're a bit different from the motors you might know. Um, they're not meant for moving a car, for example, which is meant to you know, spin up and run and run and run and just to power on the street. Um, basically, these can turn 360 degrees, but it's subdivided in 200 steps. So basically, there's a little rod on the inside and you can tell it, please turn by 1.8 degrees to the side. Um, they're not as powerful as your normal electrical motors, but they're very precise. So they, if you tell them go 10 steps to the right, they will go 10 steps to the right. So they can be used for very precise positioning. Um, right, they also come in, in more, more or less uh, precise versions. Um, but in the end, um, 1.8 degrees sounds like, you know, they're not, they, they jump quite a bit, but you can subdivide these due to, you know, technical shenanigans. Um, effectively, this gets you to, I think, the resolution of this machine is like one four hundredth of a millimeter or a centimeter. Anyway, it's sub-tenth of a millimeter precision. Um, way more precise than you can see with the eye. Not even, like literally, you cannot see the movement. It's, and you especially cannot see it on paper because that's, pens are not that precise. Yet. So this is the main driving force. Um, then you have the, the pen holder. Probably the most expensive little part of my machine because these linear rails are pretty expensive. <laughs> um, there's just super precise wagons running up and down basically, so I clamp this pen in. And this contact checks whether the pen makes contact to the, to the paper, so it will move down kind of until, you know, effectively it doesn't bend, but you know, this, this whole carriage moves up a bit and then the machine knows, oh, this is zero. And zero is what you want to draw, basically, or slightly below zero means the pen is in the paper. Slightly above zero means don't paint, basically. That's the surface semantics. Yeah, and finally, the bridge between motors and, uh, and the plan is the, the circuit board. So this is the CPU and, well, everything else, mostly just the CPU. Uh, it's called an ESP32. It's a microcontroller that well, you can't really see it here. It has a little Wi-Fi antenna just etched into the circuit board. Um, it does all the movement planning, right? So if you give it like 20 different uh, points to go to, it will calculate 
given into account maximum accelerations, maximum speeds, how to actually get there. So it will give these commands to these drivers. They translate the direct current I'm getting from my um, from my power supply, which is well invisible behind here, <laughs> um, and basically translate them into motor signals. And these are the motors you see: X1, X2, Y1, Y2, and Z. And these are the inputs for the sensors, right? So if there's a signal on one of these lines, that means, for example, you've reached the left end of your of your drawing drawing board. And yeah, this is a highly professional mount of a little fan that just cools the motor motors. Um, it's not attached; like it literally just fits into the same socket as these. If I just yank it in a little bit, um, I couldn't be bothered to build a, a proper proper mount. Um, Right, and firmware-wise, this is not something I made. Um, this is not written in Haskell, somebody else did it in C++. It's a non-trivial project to build the steering for this. Um, it's not necessarily super complicated, it's just a lot. But in any case, this little tiny chip gives you a website. So basically, you go over the Wi-Fi, you go on it. The internet or the world of this consists of one thing, which is, you know, the steering. Um, and then you can, you know, on your phone or on your laptop, you can just push a button here and it will, for example, go 100 millimeters right. Or in these macros, like this one, for example, it will slowly lower the pen until it makes contact. Then whenever it makes contact, it will set the position to zero and then retreat a bit, uh, retract. And likewise, you have uh, zeroing, like homing all the axes, uh, basically to figure, figure out where, where zero is. Um, these I don't need. These are uh, if you want to do CNC milling, right? So you can, for example, set the speed of how fast you're turning. I'm not turning my pen. Uh, that's not happening. This is the current status. This is a file that you can just put, push play on, and then it will just go through the file line by line, and each line contains a command that says go here, go here, go here. Um, so it's a very, very simple, simple-minded machine. It doesn't do a lot of a lot of thinking. And the thinking is something you have to put in manually before, um, which is part of the challenge. That's that. That's it. Right, so coding for the CNC. This is a coding conference after all, so I thought I should at least mention this a little bit. Um, my goal here is really, of course, I'm proud of what I've done. And these pictures are, I hope, at least a little bit impressive to everybody. But they shouldn't be so impressive that you think, oh, I could never do this. Because all the parts are really simple. It's a super fun project that teaches you quite a lot. And in the end, if you have anything that can move in X and Y direction and maybe up and down, say you have a 3D printer, by all means, you can do most of what I've shown you already by just literally taking tape, a pen, and putting it onto the hot end of your 3D printer and have it move around and do a lot like this. So any postcard size project you can do with any 3D printer. Um, of course, you will maybe have precision problems, but that can also be quite charming. So I encourage you to not be too impressed. Um, but the general idea of how to code for a CNC machine as well, you have an idea. For example, I want to translate a city, city's uh, power grid plan or something, or uh, one thing we did, well, the circuit lambda, for example, is something, right? So you kind of uh, have the idea. And then step two is what most people do when they, what most people stop with, right? You write the code in a software of your choice. There are many, many projects. We wrote our own software that is for the JavaScript ecosystem. There's something like um, paint.js, I think. Um, basically, libraries that give you abstractions, such as put a circle with sender and radius here and put a line here, and then you might uh, either use the library or um, code your own higher shapes, such as give me a square, right? A square would be one line on the left, then go right a bit, go up and go left. And that you can, you can extend quite a bit um, to give you very complex shapes. So in the end, SVG, for example, the vector graphics file, shape-wise, it can only do basic curves, um, line interpolation, so linear lines, and ellipses. That's it. So every picture you've ever seen in SDG consists of those on this subject one. I think I did. Don't quote me. 
Um, right, then you render this to SVG and PNG. SVG might be a higher precision, but it's also very, very big if you have a million lines, so PNG might be better. Um, until you like the result, basically. And then you're like, oh, I have it on my screen, that's cool enough. Um, and I want to put this onto a piece of paper. And then you break this down into its components. Um, since these machines tend to be super simple, mine, for example, cannot paint circles, I think. It certainly cannot paint Bezier curves. So I have to manually convert these using some off-the-shelf algorithms to little line segments, basically tricking the machine to just, you know, go along here, you'll be fine. And that you are probably still familiar with, and then the next step will be new for most people, which is just converting everything here to what's called G-code. G-code is for some reason, uh, I think it's lost in history why it's called G-code. Um, it's basically the imperative language that all these machines understand. And a lot of commands start with G for, I don't know why, um, that's why it's called G-code. Some of us start with S. Um, anyway, G-code is the name of this, this machine language. And that is a reasonably simple language. It basically has um, go to what you think is this position. It has certain other commands such as wherever you are, this is now zero, but super simple. Like if, you, if you've played some of these children's programming games where you, I don't know, Direct the turtle, for example, it's not much more complicated than that. Um, sadly, it's not a standard, it's more like a standard idea, and every machine uses its own dialect, but since it's so simple, it's not quite as bad as, say, writing assembly for different CPUs. Yeah, and then what you get out is a long file of these instructions, like typically hundreds, hundreds of thousands of lines. Um, then you upload this, you calibrate the plotter, so this would be finding the zero, putting the pen in, making sure it's, it's rigid, making sure the axis are okay, aligning the paper with what is parallel to the x-axis, because there is no sensor for that, right? You just have to, basically you put the pen to the lower left part of the paper, and then you let it move right, and then you see, oh, it's just, you know, <laughs> the lines just go apart. So you nudge the paper a bit, and uh, that you can spend a surprising amount of time on. What if the, what if the plane is not level? What if the, you know, then uh, if the plane is not level, I mean, the plane then you readjust your plane. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the machine should be reasonably level. Um, Did you run into, into that problem? Hmm? Did you run into that problem? In, uh, I didn't run into the problem because I met it really like sub-millimeter, like each of the corners of it is sub-millimeter accurate, I would say, so it's as far as I could do it by hand. Um, and I made the pen construction with this movable carriage in such a way that it can kind of um, equalize this a little bit. So if it walks, if it walks over a hump, right, it would like move up in my hand a little bit and then fall down again. That's why this this carriage is necessary, which is also necessary for other reasons, such as paper is not flat, as it turns out. <laughs> um, it's wavy. If you, when you buy it, it gets wavier when you actually put paint on it because paint is wet, and then um, it's actually one of the more interesting pitfalls I've found. Well, then you hit play and um, you watch it for a couple of minutes and then you stop watching it because it turns out it takes much longer than you wanted to because you didn't optimize your, your pathfinding algorithm. And, um, but even if you've optimized it, uh, these one of the city plans, it took like 10 hours, I guess. Um, is, is, is there a calculation you could do to estimate how complex this is? Yeah, I mean, you could estimate it. Well, the question was, is there a calculation you can do? Yes, you can estimate it. Um, of course, you could just say, give me the length of all the travel moves. Um, but um, there is an acceleration limit. There is a speed limit, right? So you would have to fully um, emulate the machine, which is a bit complicated. But typically, what you're interested in is not the time in minutes. It's should I get a coffee or should I go on vacation before this is finished, basically, right? So it's, um, and once you're reasonably happy with your machine, you just let it run overnight and you're, you know... Actually, what I haven't shown in one of the pictures, I bought a fire extinguisher in uh, <laughs> careful anticipation. But, um, right. um, haven't used it yet. Also, side note, fire extinguishers are very corrosive. Um, the machine would be completely broken if I used it once. So. <laughs> Uh, but this is for CNC machines, the pen is not going to burn anything down. Um, 
All right, so a little, little overview of the kind of almost obvious way of coding for this. So I've written this in very, very simple Haskell, but in case you're not familiar with Haskell syntax, uh, the lower line is just the same that you would write in Python, right? So line is just, you know, two points between these, please paint a line. This is just your abstract representation of it. And below here is a gput output file that you might uh, generate out of this, right? So you would create a function that takes a line and maps them to a list of strings, so a list of line, list of um, text lines detailing how to paint this linear pen movement, right? So G0 is your standard command for go as fast as you can to Z10, so that would be 10 millimeters, one centimeter above the paper. Then you, G0, again, you go as fast as you can to the start of um, where the line is supposed to be. You lower the pen, we don't care how fast, just get me there. And then at a reasonable, reasonable speed that your pen can stomach, you move to the end, and then you raise the pen again, right? So if you think about the, the very simple act of painting a line, that's what you, what you do. And of course, there's a lot of room for optimization here, right? If you want to paint two lines that are connected to each other, you do not want to lift the pen in the middle and then continue at the same point. That's, that's the basic idea. And a GCOP file will just be a lot, a lot, a lot of these. And yeah, then you do your standard code your picture actions, right? So you might have a, an abstract thing that just cuts a polygon using a line, right? You give it a line and a polygon, whatever that representation may be, and it gives you a list of the resulting pieces, right? So this is my polygon, I just go through here and I get the resulting polygon. This is one of the primitive operations. And then you might, for example, move these all around by a random amount that gets you like a shattering effect. And, um, right. Then you have your picture, then um, you say you have a function that says polygon edges, right? It gives you the edges of a polygon. Then you have a list of lines. We know how to plot a line. We put everything into this please plot me all the lines functions, and there you go. Um, this is the code for that. Um, it's not really interesting. Top is Haskell, lower is, again, Python. If you're not familiar with Haskell, just nested for loops, right? Cut the polygon and all the sub-polygons, then all the edges of the sub-polygons, plot all the lines basically in order. Yeah, that's it um, for, for the coding part. I, well, I don't have too much time left, so I'll just skip showing you a file that's just hundreds of thousands of lines of this. Um, now for, I think, five more minutes, uh, I'll give you a couple of war stories. Yeah. Basically, I hope you think that uh, this is a reasonably simple file format. What can go wrong if you put this on paper instead of a screen? Well, <clears throat> whenever anything is moving, you get resonances. So I've had a, I've had an example. I think I have it with me actually. Yeah. Show you a picture. Something I want to paint like a nice smooth flow line of a fluid, for example. And then it starts to go up here, and it's like it starts wiggling. And you, I don't want the wiggling. I want if I want the wiggling, I'm gonna code it. Um, I don't want the wiggling without having coded it. Um, let's see, so in here, these resonances, right? I don't want this wiggle. Why does this happen? What's the frequency of this wiggle? Where is it from? It's not a bad problem, but it gives you like a nice little thing to work with, right? So you check all the parts of your machine that might have a frequency like that, and then you start dampening them and putting some oil on things, and that's one of the problems you have to deal with. Um, hysteresis. Uh, what part was it? I think it was the belts. So the belts have little teeth on them, and if I, if you have, if the belt tension is too, too strong, and you run over it, um, then the belts start vibrating a little bit. Um, it's inaudible, but um, it kind of matches the, the frequency. So if I also if you go lower in general, then you you get that. Hysteresis, you know, well, may know from magnetism. The idea is that if you paint a full circle, you expect to reach where you started. In reality, what can go wrong? Well, if your pen has a little, like if this is your pen and you know the, the ballpoint kind of it perpetrates out, and it can move around here a bit, right? So if you move around, then it might end in the top possibility. So your, your circles don't close. Um, 
you can have calibration accidents. So if, for <laughs> random example, if you disable the safety features because you're debugging stuff and you forgot to re-enable them, and just say go to zero, and zero is way over there, <laughs> it will just slam into the thing and you spend two hours recalibrating the, the hardware. <laughs> Happened twice on the same evening. Oh, okay. uh, then uh, time is a very much finite resource, so uh, you have to think about optimizing the pathing. So, um, I, have a, I painted a, a map where I just, for the fun of it, said, please paint all the lines that you have, but sort them by order. Just start with very small lines and then go all big. It's very fun to watch, but it takes a long time. So it will just go around, around. I also have a picture of that. It will go around and you will recognize nothing. So this is Würzburg, the city that I'm from. Um, it's not very sharp, but what you would see is what you are seeing. It's just random scribbling. And then you continue on for like an hour and it becomes still random scribbling. You still can't recognize anything. Maybe you can imagine there's a little gap here, which will turn out to be a river, but you can't really see it, right? And then in the end, you will have like these very last lines and you will have, for example, this is a, uh, a highway, which is a, actually a single line where it'll just go buttery smooth through all through half the image and just exactly hit all the other lines that are you know close to it and it's just very satisfying to see just just come together um, that's just super cool and also if you have these maps it's really cool to to try to figure out where you're actually from so I've, I spent a bit of time actually figuring this out it's not that easy if you have zero captions on it it's somewhere around here um, Right, time is a finite resource, so are pens. Um, I painted a big picture and uh, I went like, away and after six hours I came back and the pen was just scratching on the paper. And it was one of these very expensive architectural, super fine felt pens and the, the tip of the pen was just gone. Like there's a little tube coming out of metal and there's a little, like, looks like this basically, right? This is how I started it, this was painting like this. When I came back it looked like this. It's gone. I don't know where it went. Abrasion, maybe it was pushed in. Um, it's gone. Right, so pens are a finite resource. You get into the, <laughs> the specialities of uh, pens, right? Pens are difficult, abrasion. Um, it's also an example picture of that. Um, maps. Vienna bad. Um, well, it's hard to see. There are regions that are a little bit lighter. And if I zoom in in detail, you can see this is what it should look like, and these are just way, way lighter. Um, you can see this on the, on the example pictures. Um, right, ink blots, you know, sometimes pens just do rubbish stuff, which can be nice, which, because, you know, it kind of shows that it's not actually printed. It can also be annoying. Pens can be directional, like a fountain pen, and paper isn't flat. Um, so especially when you paint something that has a lot of ink on one place, it will just wave and just go, go super bad. So there are a couple of pictures that I kind of would like to paint, but I can't. Because, uh, where is it? Oh, the particle shooter. Um, this is a physics simulation. It's a bit hard to see, so I'm shooting electrons out of the middle. These are all potentials that these electrons scatter on. It looks like an amoeba. If you paint this, you have 10,000 pens going in the middle. You will just rip the paper apart. It, won't, it just won't work. And since I'm a bit short of time, I would just very briefly show a couple of others. So this is the lambda I showed you earlier. This is what I showed you earlier. Just cut into plywood. Um, what else do we have? This is one of... No, doesn't show that well. This is... The Pioneer plaque, if, you, if you've seen it, it's uh, etched in gold and we shot it into space. This is basically your place in the universe. Um, I took it out and actually this is a, a bigger version of it with well, checkerboard background. So this is where Earth is, this is the relative distance to certain pulsars that are observable over large scales of the universe. And um, well, this makes for a nice, nice postcard for, for friends and things like these. This is what... I'm hoping the flow lines will eventually become. It doesn't come off very well on the, on the screen, so I'll just skip it. And yeah, um, there are lots of examples like these, and that's why I also brought, you know, on the 
If you want to come to the front later or after the talk, I can show you a little, a uh, few real life examples. And the one thing about the real life examples I want to, to mention is that it's, it's just different if you're in front of them. And one thing I particularly like is breaking this, um, uh, basically being in front of a screen, you immediately think about the screen space. If you're in front of a picture that may have completely different visuals depending on, on the distance you are from it. A screen you will always see at screen distance. So one example, I, the last one I'm going to show now, is this blob, which is not my idea, but I recreated it. It's a geodesic sphere, and I just you know smashed it in a little bit in Blender, exported the wireframe, and then plotted that. Um, for you, it will. This probably looks like a sphere that's been pushed around a bit and has been pixelated. Um, this is what it looks like in A2 on the plotter, and this is where it looks. Uh, what it looks like in real life. And what I like about it, if you go close up to it, it's clearly composed only of straight lines. You see straight lines, you see maybe a triangle. Um, it's very flat, it's kind of boring. Then you move away one or two meters, and at some point, and you don't really know when, it will become three-dimensional. And you're not quite sure when, when that happened, right? So you're like, whoa, how did that happen? And then you go closer and again, and you try to find the point, like, how does this transition work? And it just doesn't. It just is at some point, and uh, that's a, a very interesting effect you can, you can get there, right? So that kind of closes the circle to the art part and not just the visually nice, um, nice part. Yeah, that's all I have for today. Um, everything here is open sourced, mm, well documented, but we don't have a readme so others can see it, but uh, if you're interested in it, um, just go to GitHub Kuchen. Q-U-C-H-E-N, like on the first slide. You will find it, shoot me a message, and I'm, I'm happy to help you out with this. Um, it's a super fun hobby that teaches you quite a lot, and you have something to show off. Mm -hmm. so.